Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Chocolate Life Live. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com, and I want to welcome everybody who's joining us today for this live stream. Our topic today, um, I hope everyone will find a, a fascinating and interesting one, um, and it is very, very much a follow-up on many of the topics I've been having in the last couple of weeks. Um, this is going to sort of put, I think, an exclamation point on a bunch of the things that I've said. So hopefully tie up a bunch of loose ends and make a whole lot of sense of some of the things that I've been talking about um, over the last little while. So if you are watching, what I ask you to do is go to the comments. Uh, let me know where you are in fact tuning in from. So let me know, I mean, I'll, I'll see your name. I'll, let, I'll find out if you're watching on YouTube, LinkedIn or Facebook, but let me know what part of the world you're, you're, you're tuning in from so I can get a sense for where things are going today. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I have to, um, to say to start out, except to say that over my left shoulder, which is my right shoulder, because um, I'm turned around here, it's over my right shoulder, um, is the homepage of The Chocolate Life right now. So you can go there and you can um, see um, you know, the stories that I've been publishing in the last little while. And if you go and click on the, um, this um, card in the top rail, uh, what you'll do is you'll open it up and you'll get to this week's uh, this week's post. And I do a post for every single one of the Chocolate Life Live live streams. If you'd like to know more about one of them, you can go back to the homepage. You can click on the Chocolate Life Live calendar. And here what you'll do is you'll find uh, up, um, a list of scheduled right, topics we're going to be looking at, as well as an archive to all of the previous topics we'll be talking about. And this will take you to the page on the Chocolate Life where um, you can um, go and get all the background and all the resources that are associated um, with this. Uh, I should also point out that if you do go to one of these posts, um, what you'll do is you'll find, I'm just scrolling down to the bottom really, really quickly. What you'll do is you'll find a link. So right now we're live on YouTube. So if I were to click on this link, you would actually see a picture and picture of our being live on YouTube, which would be a little meta. Um, but you can also find uh, the LinkedIn and Facebook. And these are archive links. So if you want to look at this a week from now or a month from now or a year from now, everything is archived and you can go back and refer to it. So yeah, no, really, really exciting. Um, um, I'm excited for today. And I want to say hello to Nick, who is um, connecting in from Scotland. Um, so Nick, yay, I'm glad to hear today. And you know, I'm interested in if any of what it is that I'm saying today um, resonates with you, um, or if you have um, something that you object to, um, or might want to be considered um, in a slightly different way. Now, normally what I would do is I would go and scroll through um, the post. So if there are resources and other things, you'd be able to see those resources. But what I want to do today is rather than have people look at the text and try to decipher the text as I'm going along, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a very, very quick sort of high level, um, a high level presentation. So did this um, um, and I'm going to show you the, the PDF of this because this follows the order. Um, that is in the in the post. I don't necessarily know that I'm going to I'm going to post this. There's nothing in here that's not in the post. This is just for our reference during the course of today's live stream. And so, without further ado, um, so one of the one of the questions I started getting from people after I posted this um, yesterday um, was why why are we talking about you know redefining craft chocolate? Um, and as I say, I, I want to put an exclamation point into some of the discussions we've been having. So the last session was what is chocolate to begin with? So what are the legal definitions of talk chocolate? We've been talking about chocolate quality. And over the course of the last um, couple of months, um, I've been giving a number of presentations. So uh, in Brazil, um, also at Chocoa, um, virtually in Amsterdam, where the talk was, you know, what does the craft chocolate market need to grow? What does the world of craft chocolate need to grow? And one of the things I talked about, and I, and I presented those presentations here, 
one of those one of those topics I think is really important um, is the notion of community. So as a community, we tend to get together for a couple of days here and a couple of days there. There's not a global community um, where we actually conduct business. There are a couple of online communities. The Chocolate Life is one, a couple on Facebook, but there's no active professional community of craft chocolate makers. And I think that's one thing that we need to, um, one thing that needs to be developed. I also talk about awareness. So um, we are not aware, for example, of how many craft chocolate makers there are. We don't know where they are in the world, uh, the distribution of them um, with any kind of precision. Um, we also don't know how much cocoa these companies are purchasing. We don't know the distribution of cocoa beans. So how much from this country and how much from that country? We don't know how much chocolate these companies are making. We don't know how much revenue they're generating. And so we actually can't talk about the impact that the craft chocolate community is having as a community, as a whole. And I think that to grow the craft chocolate community, that is one of the things that we need to do. Um, and another thing I've been talking about um, is talking about language. Um, and it's one of the things that I post uh, at the top of the post um, um, for today's live stream is language is important. Words and forms beliefs, beliefs and forms actions, action have consequences. And I've made the point in the past um, that um, within the community, um, we don't have commonly agreed upon definitions of what bean to bar is, for example. We don't have commonly agreed upon definitions of what direct trade is or fair trade is. We don't have a common definition for what craft is. And if we as a community are confused in the sense that we don't have a, an agreed upon way that we're going to talk about these topics, uh, number one is it's hardly surprising that um, the prospective consumer is confused. Now, I'm not talking about the people who've already brought, bought into the notion of craft chocolate, the people who get the value proposition, who understand what it is we're doing. I'm talking about if we want to grow craft chocolate, what we need to do is we need to appeal to customers who are not currently buying the chocolate. And I think that one of the most important things we need to have in order to be able to do that is a common language. We need to have an agreed upon set of definitions and we need to or at least a not agreed upon set of definitions and agreed upon marketing language and agreed upon approach to how it is that we're going to talk to people so that they are not confused. Right? And that's why this topic today, what I want to do is I want to engage people in discussions around um, what I think are core definitions, foundational definitions, with the hope of being able to um, engage discussion um, in a meaningful way so that we can come to consensus um, about these things. So we can start driving some common language we can all agree on uh, to go and move forward. And so that's why if you're not a member of the Chocolate Life right now, um, click on the join button. There's one here in the lower right. And what you can do is you can go and um, add comments on the Chocolate Life. Um, you can, of course, add them on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. But I think that the best way to uh, engage in the conversation and continue the conversation, join the Chocolate Life. It's free. Um, um, if if uh, it, it's it, they're always a free tier and throw your comments um, there so we can continue the discussion there. Okay. And so with uh, that out of the way, let's start talking about the first one. So um, what do we mean by the word ethics and ethical and why is this important? The reason why I think it's important, and we'll get to this in, in greater detail when we talk about um, bean to bar, is that um, when we go back to the origination of the phrase bean to bar, that um, I believe it, John Scharfenberger and his partner, Robert Steinberger, Scharfenberger chocolate maker, 1996 or thereabouts, are the ones who coined the term bean to, bean to bar, or at least started using the team term bean to bar um, for this nascent um, small chocolate maker movement, right? And one of the things that's missing um, um, from what it is that they're talking about is that, you know, bean to bar was a, um, it was a pushback against a big industrial chocolate, but the notion of ethics and sustainability were not a part of the original messaging as, as I recall. Now I have reached out to John uh, Scharfenberger, um, and I've asked him to send me some information about it. I don't have that yet, um, but of course, when I do get that, I will be um, adding it to the conversation. And before we jump in, I want to say thank you very much to Teresa, who's joining us from Atlanta, um, Than, who also reaches out and says hello to you, Nick. So ethics and ethical. What does it mean? What do ethics mean? What does it mean to be ethical? Now, there are lots of dictionary definitions, and many of them 
um, are sort of complicated and confusing. And so what I want to do is I want to say that when it comes right down to it, so the notion of ethics and ethical is all about not taking unfair advantage of someone. So if you say you're ethical, right, you say your business practices are ethical, you, the royal you, you, your company, if your business practices um, are ethical, what you're saying is, is that at no place in any of the dealings that you have with farmers and suppliers, vendors, and customers, right? So this is a full 360 look at things, right? You do not take advantage, and specifically, you do not take unfair advantage of anybody that you do business with. And one of the things I like about that is it's an incredibly simple definition, right? It's just, I promise, or I say that I'm not making, I'm not taking unfair advantage of anyone in any way. Really, really simple. And that's one of the reasons why I like it. You'll find that I like very, very simple um, definitions. So when we get to sustainable and sustainability, again, not part of the original definition of being to bar, as I recall, um, this is very, very complicated. If you, it can be very complicated. It doesn't need to be very complicated. So if you go and you, for example, look at the 17 UN Sustainability Development Goals, the UN SDGs, um, I haven't put a link to them in the post for today. I will put a link to the UN SDGs. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, um, I'll put them in. Um, but when it comes to sustainable and sustainability, I think there's a really, really simple way to talk about it, right? And which is that um, uh, I am going to treat the trees. So what in this case, the cocoa trees, the crop that I'm growing, right? Um, the local environment, which means the ecosystems which support the trees and the ecosystem which depend on the trees. So the crop and the supporting and the dependent ecosystems, right? The, the farm, for want of a better term, the farmers and their families, right? And the communities within, the, the, within which the farmers and their families lives, I'm going to treat them in a way, I'm going to work with them in a way so that they are healthy and viable 100 years from now. Right? Very, very simple. Everything I do has got a multi-generational multi um, aspect to it. So I may get involved, for example, with regenerative agriculture because regenerative agriculture is sort of a superset um, in some respects of organic. And I've been talking with some people and I think that organic agriculture will be replaced by regenerative agriculture within the next five to 10 years. Um, because really it's, it's, it's more than just about the amendments we put in the soil. It's about how we treat the soil. We want the soil to be healthy and thriving a hundred years from now. We need farmers. We need their families. We need their communities. There needs to be enough money in the system to be able to support the environmental and social aspects of things that we're doing. And sustainability talks about that. Everything we're doing has got this multi-generational time frame associated. We're looking for, we're looking to do things and make sure that things are healthy and thriving 100 years from now. Again, I think that's a real simple definition. It's easy to understand. Um, I've been going on about it for a couple of minutes, but I think it's one that is also very, very easy to communicate. And that ease of communication and that ease of understanding, right? You can build into it. Yeah, we think recycling should be a part of sustainability. That would be what a North American person um, or would be most interested. Somebody who's from Europe will have social justice aspects um, thrown in there, things having to do with fairness, right? But fundamentally, it's all about making sure that um, we have cocoa farms, we have cocoa farm <laughs> trees, we have, we have families and we have communities um, 100 years from now. Um, I, I, the, it appeals um, in a really, really straightforward and intu intuitive way. Um, so I think that's a really wonderful thing. Um, so after sustainability, um, single origin. So single origin, why is single origin confusing? Um, that's because it can be, right? Um, so uh, I, I believe that single origin exists along a continuum. There is a maximalist definition of single origin, which means that all of the ingredients in the bar come from the country on the bar, right? Um, and that's one way to describe single origin. I don't, necess don't necessarily ascribe to that definition, but it is a definition, right? A less maximalist or a minimalist definition of bean to bar or, or of single origin would be that the cocoa beans 
have to be from the origin, just the cocoa beans. It's only important that the cocoa beans come from that origin. That origin could be an entire country. So it could be single origin Venezuelan, or it could be a single origin from a region. So it could be from the state of Tabasco in Mexico. It could be single origin from a particular farm, for example, the Fazenda Bonanza um, in Bahia, Brazil. So the origin, right, it can be very, um, can be very um, um, general and it can move to very, very specific. But when we talk about single origin, a minimalist definition would be that only the cocoa beans need to come from that origin, right? Moving up the spectrum, so somewhere between minimalist and maximalist, you might say, well, no, the cocoa beans and the cocoa butter need to come from the origin if you want to call it single origin. Not a whole lot of people do that. Um, and I actually think it's one of the reasons why a lot of people do two ingredient chocolate because it's very difficult to get single origin cocoa butter um, or cocoa butter made from the same origin as the beans, specific origin of the beans um, at a reasonable price. Um, and I think economics do drive some of the decisions, certainly not 100% of the decisions um, to do that. So that would be one way to think about it. Um, another company might say, well, no, I want the cocoa beans, the cocoa butter and the sugar to come from the same origin. Now, there are a lot of origins where they grow cocoa. They don't necessarily grow a lot of sugar. If I'm doing a milk chocolate, they don't necessarily have a milk and dairy industry. And so I, I'm in a minimalist position. So at the very minimum, the cocoa beans need to come from that region. Um, if possible, the cocoa butter should come from that region. Um, I don't care so much if the sugar and the non-cocoa ingredients come from that origin, right? It's not important to me. But I do think that somewhere it should be listed what the country of origin of these ingredients are going to be. So if you're not using cocoa butter from the same origin at some place, you could do it on the bar, you could do it somewhere on the website, you should say, I'm using cocoa beans from Venezuela, but the cocoa butter comes from Indonesia, right? So, right, or if not Indonesia, Bali, or as close as you can get to what, where you're talking about. And there are some people who do um, talk about the origin of the cocoa butter uh, when it's not the same origin as the beans. And I encourage that sort of visibility. We, people talk about transparency. I encourage that sort of visibility. We talk about country of origin labeling when we can, right? Um, speaking of single origin, I want to uh, welcome Aji. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who's um, connecting from India today. Thanks very much for joining us here today. Um, and at any point, if you have a question, you have a comment about anything that I'm saying, you agree with me, you don't agree with me, you think there's a nuance that I've left out, you think there's something that I've skipped, um, you think that um, you want to point me in another direction um, because you, you, maybe there's something I haven't considered, um, please, uh, please feel free to throw that in the comment. I want to let you know that what I will do is when I get comments like that, what I will do is I will throw them into the, um, you know what? I haven't, um, I need to reload this page. Um, is that um, I will throw them in here as questions. So these are some questions that people sent me by email. And so what I did, or some comments that people threw me at email, I took their comments and I threw them um, into the um, into the body of the post for today. So please do that. Let me know, and I will. I want to get the discussion going. I you know I I want to make sure that this doesn't end today. That we do have a fruitful discussion going forward where we can talk about these things. So we have this notion of what does it mean to be ethical, right? Um, right. What does it mean to be sustainable? What does it mean to be single origin, fair trade? So um, I am not a big fan. Uh, people who know me know that I'm not a big fan of institutionalized fair trade, FLO fair trade, Rainforest Alliance slash Oots fair trade. I personally believe that they are socially acceptable economic imperialism. And to put it very, very bluntly, um, I don't have to worry about these videos being demonetized because I'm not monetizing them to begin with. But fundamentally, it's a bunch of white people in the global north telling brown people in the global south what's fair right? We're asking you to adopt, right? 
concepts which we think are important to us, right? And we're asking you to pay for the privilege of adopting it. That's what the certification fees are about, right? So we're asking you to pay for the privilege of adopting our values. And then we're asking you to take 100% of the economic risk for doing so, because we're not guaranteed, we're not the we, meaning the certification. So Rainforest Alliance does not guarantee to purchase 100% of the cocoa that is certified as Rainforest Alliance. They do not guarantee, or coffee or tea or any of the products. They do not guarantee to purchase the products, right? They ask um, the cooperative or the estate holder to pay for the privilege of being certified. Um, and the same thing is true of FLO for trade, FLO for trade, fair trade. They do not accept responsibility for marketing and selling the product that is certified. And I believe it is this, this, this disconnect, this gap. We're asking, we're asking you to pay for the privilege of adopting our values, but we are not taking any economic risk in what's going on. And that's what it is that makes this um, socially acceptable economic imperialism. Now, so fair trade may be a part of an answer. So it may work in some cases. You're a very, very small company. You don't have the resources to be able to go and visit your farms on a regular basis. Um, so fair trade um, can give you some sense, right, that you're doing good, but not necessarily the case. Um, yeah, no, Teresa, absolutely ironic, um, you know, ironic that it's called fair trade. Um, if you go to um, the post um, for today's live stream, one of the things that you'll see under the, under the um, section about fair trade, there's actually an article that I wrote, a post that I wrote some time ago, who decides what's fair, um, where you can dump, jump into more about what it is that I feel about fair trade um, to do that. But yeah, no, um, again, um, I don't think fair trade is the answer. It's a part of an answer. And so, um, so think about what it is you're doing. When you're thinking about what fair trade means, right, I would go and, right, point you back to what I think is a good definition of ethical. Am I taking unfair advantage of anybody anywhere in the chain, you know, from the farm and everybody up through the consumer? Yes or no. And I don't think if I use that sort of definition, unfair advantage, um, I don't think fair trade is ethical, right? I just, it fails the test for me. Um, now, right, um, if anybody disagrees with me, please let me know. I'm really, really interested. Again, I mean, I don't wanna say that people who are involved in fair trade are bad people. I don't want to impugn anything about anybody. I think most of them, believe that what they're doing is good. They're providing a service. They're doing a good thing. Um, and I fully believe that. I don't think that there are, um, I, I don't personally know of anybody who's in the fair trade business who is behaving in a way that I would think of that is uh, unethical. So I don't think, I don't know that there are individuals who are doing it. I just think that the system, right, is fundamentally unfair. Um, and I don't know that it can be fixed given the fact that it is a one size fits, fits all model. We have one definition of what fair is, that one definition of fair is going to apply to every place in the world. And that's something that I hope doesn't happen when it comes to quote unquote certifying um, regenerative agriculture. I mean, there's no way that you can have a one size fits all certification system for regenerative, regenerative for two different crops because what needs to happen to take care of the crop is different if I'm growing chia or if I'm growing cocoa or if I'm growing coffee in one part of the world or, or coffee in another part of the world. The local ecosystems is different. And therefore, what needs to get done from a regenerative agricultural perspective needs to be very, very local. And if I have a one size global, uh, a global one size fits all checklist of how to do things, then the challenge becomes um, how do you do that without being unfair to some people, right? So it works if your model works in a particular area, it doesn't work if your model doesn't work in what your idea of what regenerative agriculture is in one area uh, and is in another. And that's one of the reasons why I think um, the economic model of fair trade, when the premium is the same everywhere in the world, and it doesn't take into account the individual economics of different growing countries. And what's happening is that if I'm at the bargaining table, 
in the negotiating table. I'm a, I'm a cooperative and I'm in one country and I'm saying, well, the cost of living here means that the premium should be 15 cents a kilo. Um, and the country next door says, well, the cost of living here is lower and the premium should only be 10 cents a kilo. Um, then what happens is that the country with a higher cost of living might say, well, I'm going to accept the 10 cents a kilo because I don't want to put myself at an economic disadvantage in terms when it comes to selling my cocoa. People aren't going to buy, quote unquote, fair trade certified cocoa for me if the premium is, 50, is, is higher for my country than it is in another country. And so there, it, the whole negotiation process exerts downward pricing pressure, in my opinion, in a way that's unfair. The people who have the power in the negotiating situation maintain the power in the negotiating situation. Um, so something to consider if you haven't really thought about before. So the next thing I want to talk about is direct trade. Direct trade's uh, an idea um, that's been around for quite some time. There's supposed to be a direct trade cocoa association. It's been around uh, more than a decade, if I recall. And for me, the notion of, so I think that the accepted definition, what people think about when they think about direct trade is what they talk about is they talk about reducing the number of intermediaries, right? Who touch the cocoa between your factory door and the farm gate. And while that's certainly not a bad thing, I think that the best way to think about direct trade is that what you, you, you as a maker of a product are developing direct relations, personal relationships with the people that you're buying your ingredients from. So if I'm involved in direct trade when it comes to chocolate, I know who my cocoa farmers are. I have been there. I have you know, shaken their hands. I've developed a personal relationship with them. I'm going to make you know, long-term commitments to them, right? If you say something is going to happen, you know from personal experience that it has happened. If you say you're going to show up, you show up. I mean, I think these are really, really important concepts when it comes to the direct trade relationship. Now, it's very unlikely that what you're going to do, right, if you're a small chocolate maker here in the United States, that what you're going to be able to do is handle 100% of the logistics of getting the cocoa from the farm gate to your factory door, right? Unless you're buying in such small quantities, you can put it in your luggage and bring it home with you. But you have to get the cocoa from the farm. You have to get it either to the port of export, whether that's a seaport or it's an airport, you know, somebody has to handle the phytosanitary certification. Somebody has to handle the export documentation. It could be you. You could be doing that. Um, somebody is probably doing the testing. However, you're not doing that. So that's involved. You got somebody who's actually doing the transport. You have somebody who's doing customs clearance at the country uh, of entry. So at the port of entry, again, whether it's a seaport or it's an airport. And then you have somebody who's getting the cocoa beans from the port to the factory door you need middlemen. There need to be logistics providers in the middle of there. I mean, you have enough to do to learn to make chocolate that dealing with the minutia of did I file my ISM properly or have I taken care of making sure that all the I's and all the T's have been dotted and crossed um, when it comes to export documentation so it arrives um, you know, at the port in my country, that it's actually going to clear customs. You know, having professionals do that is absolutely fine. I don't have any problem with that. If you can reduce the number of people, that's fine, right? But being direct trade means that you've been to the farm, you've been to the farm gate, you go on a regular basis, right? You know who your farmers are. You probably know who their kids are. You've seen the conditions of uh, the, that go on there. You can talk about from personal experience what's going on. You can declare, I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. Now, you might buy from a broker, right? And that broker, I suppose, could be involved in direct trade. So the broker might know, right, what's going on. Right. And they could be handling all the logistics for you, but you're still once removed. Right. So if you're buying through a broker, don't care who the broker is. Right. Even though they may be direct trade in terms of their model. So they're developing the relationships. They're doing the work. They know what's going on. If you've never been to the farm, you're not direct trade. You're one step removed from direct trade. You cannot call yourself direct trade if you're one step removed. Right. Um, and again, if you disagree with me, please let me know. 
Well, you know, because, you know, that's part of what it is that I want to talk about today. It's where I want to set um, the stage. So with that, right, let's get to um, bean to bar. And so what does bean to bar mean? So again, I think that there are maximalist definitions for bean to bar, and there are minimalist definitions from bean to bar. And I think that's just the nature of the world. Um, but we need to be very, very clear. And I don't think we should be dogmatic about what's going on in terms of the definition. So I um, tend towards, personally, I tend towards a minimalist definition. So bean to bar is just a discussion of a process. I purchase cocoa beans, right? And I am responsible for overseeing all of the steps in the conversion, the transformation of those cocoa beans into chocolate bars. Right? I think that's a fine definition of bean to bar. I could be liquor to bar. I could be nib to bar. Maybe I'm doing powder and I'm making compound by using another fat. So I'm not really chocolate, but I can make bars. But what I'm doing is I'm describing what it is that I do. Right? A maximalist definition of bean to bar says I do all of those things in a factory that I own or control, a facility that I own or control. So all of the steps that I oversee, all of the steps that I, and I'm using a royal I, I'm talking about the chocolate maker, the owner of the company, somebody who's employed by the company to, to do these transformation steps. There could be a bunch of people involved in it. So you could have a dedicated roaster, somebody who's running some of the machines. I'm just talking about the royal, right? Is that a sort of maximalist definition of that, all right, is going to be, um, in order for a bean to be to be a bean to bar chocolate maker, I have it has to be everything has to be done in my facility, right? Um, and, you know I, whether you own it or the bank owns it or some uh, bank owns it or some combination of you and your banker or investors. You know I don't know, but it's in my facility. Um, I think that's a little too dogmatic uh, because I think there is value in recognizing that um, doing some of the transformation steps in producing countries is a value. So let's say that I'm a small chocolate maker. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the country where I buy my beans as part of my direct trade relationship with my farmer. And what I'm, then I'm going to do is I'm going to take the beans right from the farm and take them to a factory um, in the producing country. While I'm there, I am going to personally oversee the roast and the grind. So I'm going to roast the beans, convert them into liquor while I'm there or convert them into nibs. Six of one, half a dozen, I don't really care. Right. And then what happens is, is that liquor or those nibs are going to be transported to my facility, right? Somewhere else and um, somewhere else in the rest of the world. Right. Uh, there's value in that. Number one is it delivers more value in the producing country. So because what they're doing is they're taking an agricultural commodity um, and they're adding value to it. And people are getting paid in the producing country to add that value to it. But I think also um, importantly, and we need to think, think about this, is that I'm not shipping waste. So if you're a small chocolate maker, you know that if you buy a ton of cocoa beans, excuse me, by the time you clean them, by the time you roast them, you're going to lose, what, 6% moisture at least in roasting them, right? And then if you take the shells off, that 100 um, kilograms of cocoa beans might turn into 70 kilos, so a metric ton. So 700 kilos becomes, a uh, 1,000 kilos becomes, what, somewhere between 700 and 750 um, kilos worth of usable cocoa nib or, or liquor or something like that. And that's a lot of waste. I mean, you are shipping a lot of waste. And, you know, that goes into a container. The container has to be dressed, right, to um, reduce the possibility of moisture damage. Um, or you put it in grain pro bags or something like that. Uh, and it's on pallets. There is a lot of waste in shipping cocoa. And it's going off either in an airplane or it's going on a boat. And those are um, powered by petroleum, and we need to think about carbon footprint. So I think that the definition of bean to bar needs to be flexible enough, right, to enable a chocolate maker, right, to go to the producing country where they're purchasing their beans and to personally oversee, right, the transformation of the beans into some semi-finished product, right, whether it's nibs or liquor or a combination of nibs or, li nibs or liquor and maybe some cocoa butter in the producing country, and then have that stuff transported um, back to my factory where I finish the job. So I'm all happy about doing that. 
The idea being, however, what's really important with that is that it needs to be under my personal supervision every single time, right? I can't, once I've done it once or once I've done it twice, just pick up the phone and have the farmer ship some cocoa beans to the factory and have that done. I need to be there every single time in order to do it. It's a personal supervision thing as far as I'm concerned. Whether 100% of that happens in a facility I own or 100% or that it's it's split between two or more facilities, that's fine. And when I say that, I don't care about wrapping. I don't care if, I don't think wrapping is part of the definition of bean to bar. And as a matter of fact, if you go back to Scharfenberger, um, they did their 100 gram bars. They deposited them and wrapped them in their facility in Berkeley, but they sent the little five gram tasting squares. They shipped the chocolate to New Jersey. And at a company in New Jersey, deposit and wrap the Neapolitans in New Jersey and then ship them back to California. I don't care. It's what matters for me, right, is the chocolate that's being wrapped, less how the chocolate is wrapped. I mean, you know, one of the, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to um, a, de- a, a sort of a, an ironic description of craft chocolate in, in a couple of slides. So I'm fine with bean to bar. Um, as long as we get the idea of personal supervision. Um, And that also is the case where if I'm a farmer and I'm in a producing country, this happens in Brazil a lot. If I send my beans to a factory and they transform my beans for me, I'm not there overseeing every step of the way, except wrapping. Then I can't call myself a bean to bar chocolate maker. I can't call myself a farm to bar chocolate maker, right? Because it's not a question that the factory is not owned by me. It's not a question of whether the factory is using my recipes, right? It's that fact that I'm not in the factory overseeing what's being done every single time. I mean, if I'm a chocolate maker, right, I own a chocolate manufacturing company, I and mean, I can name a couple of companies where the person who owns the company actually knows nothing about manufacturing chocolate. So what they've done is they've hired people whose job it is to oversee the manufacturing of chocolate. So the owner doesn't know how to make chocolate. Their employees know how to make chocolate. Are they being debar? It's a supervision thing, right, as far as I'm concerned. And I hope you agree with me when it comes down to that, right, when it comes down to that, uh, when it comes down to that aspect of the difference between a sort of a minimalist definition and a maximalist definition of being to bar. What I think is a real problem with being to bar, right, and the way many people construct it, and I've seen this happen, very long discussions about this when I was in um, Brazil on my most recent trip, talking with people down there, is there's a tendency to conflate other things, right? So when, to the notion of bean to bar, so when Scharfenberger and Steinberg um, coined the term bean to bar, what they were trying to do is they were trying to set themselves off from big industrial chocolate makers. So somehow there was something about doing it on small equipment and having um, people, you know, you, you know, just doing it on small equipment and doing it um, in a deliberate kind of way, right? Um, set them apart from what industrial chocolate makers were. So big confectionery chocolate makers. Um, and if I think about, go back to my memories of that time, it's 20 some odd years now, is I don't remember them saying, well, it's in order to be bean to bar chocolate, it also has to be ethical and it has to be sustainable, right? That's not part of the original definition. And so I think that when we conflate topics like ethical and sustainable sustainable, um, onto the notion of bean to bar as a way of differentiating um, what we're doing compared with big chocolate makers, then what we're doing is we're erecting a a house of cards that um, the more things we put on top of the base of it's just a process. I'm making beans. I'm taking beans and transforming them into bars. The more things we put on top of it, the less um, stable the structure becomes. And you and I might have a difference about what direct trade means, or you and I might have a difference about what fair trade means, or we might have a difference about what sustainable means, right? And all single origin, right? So the more things that you layer on top of the foundational definition of being the bar, the more opportunities you give for people to disagree with you. And I think that's what we've seen over the course of the last 20 some odd years. I mean, you know, back in 2006, there was a, there was a 
an effort to create an American craft chocolate association. And it would have been Sean Eskinosi and Art Pollard and perhaps Stephen DeVries and Alan McClure or Patrick Chocolate. And they never started the American Craft Chocolate Association for two reasons. Number one is um, a lot of the chocolate at that point wasn't very good. Um, one can argue that a lot of craft chocolate today is not very good. Um, and they were afraid that people would call it the American Crap Chocolate Association. Um, you know, I have that from one of the people um, who was there and uh, taking part in the negotiations. Um, the other one is that they couldn't come up with a definition of what craft meant, right? What bean to bar meant. And the reason why they couldn't do it is that they're just layering all of these things on top of it. And it's not that they didn't have consensus around the basic idea. It's just that when they started adding all these other topics, all these other concepts, all these other things on top of it, um, they had this wobbly house of cards and nobody could agree on the entire edifice. And so I would, um, in my experience, if what we want to do is we want to create clear messages that everybody can understand is not to try to overload right, to take a concept and throw so many things into the meaning that uh, it makes it really difficult. Number one, it makes it difficult for people to understand. Uh, and number two is people can disagree with small aspects of what you're doing and just completely dismiss the entire thing. Now, I personally don't think that after 25, 26 years, that bean to bar is a good differentiator, right? Um, and the reason why is that you get a company, at least here in the United States, Right? And I have to recognize, I had a conversation with somebody um, about two weeks ago, um, interview for an article that's being read. And this may be a North American viewpoint. All right? And so one of the questions about Bean to Bar and the definition of Bean to Bar is, is this only a North American viewpoint? If I'm in Spain, if I'm in Brazil, if I'm in another country, um, does this apply? Please let me know right? um, in the comments. The, the, the questions are on the post for this. Right? But... Um, here in the United States, I can walk into a local drugstore, CVS, sort of like a Boots in the UK. And at the end of the confectionery slash food aisle, the candy aisle, um, there'll be an end cap, right? And Lint will be on one side and Gear Deli will be on the other. And that makes sense because Lint owns Gear Deli. And on the front of the Gear Deli boxes, it will say, proudly bean to bar our commitment to ultimate quality. And when that happens, oh my gosh, Consumers will be confused. Well, if I can buy bean to bar chocolate for $3.99 for 100 grams, why am somebody asking me to pay $9.99 for 60 grams? Right? It's confusing. If we and and that's why I think people are trying to overload bean to bar, right? Because they're trying to take the term bean to bar, which has been co-opted by big chocolate, and trying to say, well, our version, our definition of bean to bar is something different, right? And when we say bean to bar, we mean ethical, we mean sustainable and all these other kinds of things. But, you know, not all small chocolate makers um, <clears throat> necessarily meet all those requirements. And so it's very difficult to take the 2,500 or more small chocolate makers in the world and say that, you know, small bean to bar chocolate, right, is different from big bean to bar chocolate because all small bean to bar chocolate makers have these things in common. Right. I don't think you can make those general statements. I don't think it works. Right. And so I would be very, very careful about overloading any of the statements that we're making here. All right. Um, so what we want to do is be clear, unambiguous to be able to talk about it. Right. Without um, being raising anybody's um, I'm going to say hackles without giving people an opportunity to object. We want to be straightforward. What does ethical mean? Well, ethical means I'm not going to try to take unfair advantage of you as my customer, or I'm not going to take unfair advantage of my, of my farmer. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Sustainable. Well, what it means is, you know, I work in a system where I want to make sure that everybody who's involved at the cocoa farm, you know, the trees and the people and the communities are healthy and thriving a hundred years from now. Such a simple definition. It's intuitive. It makes sense. We want to, we want to be able to get at that simple level. Uh, understanding and communication, not make things more overly complicated than they need to be. Um, so from bean to bar, farm slash tree to bar, I think I've, uh, I, I don't think, but I've sort of foreshadowed this, some of it. So if I am a farmer and I send my cocoa beans to another fact, to a factory, 
right? And I say, well, here's my recipe, transform my beans into chocolate. But I am not actively involved in supervising, overseeing every single batch, every single time. I can't call myself a bean to bar chocolate maker. I, I don't care that the facility is for rent. For me, it's a supervision issue. I need to supervise everything that's going on in terms of the transformations of the beans to the finished product, right? And if that means sleeping next to the melanger so that I don't over, over refine it, that's what it means, right? Just that level of commitment, that level of understanding. I can rely on the factory's chocolate maker to help me through the parts of the process I don't completely understand. So it is a collaborative process. Well, almost everything in the world is um, these days. So I don't have a problem with that, all right? As long as there's the supervision aspect of it. However, one of the places where my mind was completely changed as a result of conversations with a couple of people while I was in Bahia, um, I was uh, on a minimalist definition of this and I've gone to a maximalist definition of this. If you want to call yourself a farm to bar chocolate maker or a tree to bar chocolate maker, <clears throat> I don't have, excuse me, a particular preference of one over the other. But if you wanna call yourself a farm to bar or a tree to bar chocolate maker, you have to own the farm. You have to own the farm. It is not negotiable. You have to own it, right? You can't be, oh, somebody else owns the farm and I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna provide money for technical assistance. Or I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna, you know, once or once a year or twice a year, I'm just gonna come in and, and do this work. No, owning the farm means that you have a financial stake in the employee's health and well-being. You're paying their wages, right? You're responsible for their taxes. If there are benefits in Brazil, for example, um, lots of employee benefits, then you are taking care of them. You are responsible for them in the largest sense. If you want to call yourself a farm-to-bar chocolate maker, you have to own the farm. Now, if we look at wine and we look at other kinds of things, I could own the farm, but employ people to, to do the work for me. Right. And so in that respect, it's sort of like an estate holder. Right. Right. It's rare. I could be a small holder farmer and transform some or all of the cocoa beans that I grow on my farm into finished product, in which case, you know, I'm a tree to bar, I'm a farm to bar chocolate maker. I right, I, I work the land, right? Most smallholders, um, except for very, very complicated issues associated with land tenure and things like that. Most small farmers, you know, are going to own what is there. Except in Ghana, I might own the farm, but I have to sell the beans. Complicated, right? It's, it's, it can be complicated. But the, the idea is, is that um, I have this direct connection. I'm, I'm not an absentee, right? In the respect that um, I'm a chocolate maker, right? And what I do is I've made a commitment to the farm, but I don't actually have an ownership commitment to the farm. And in that respect, over the last couple of months, I think that my, my, um, definition of what it means to be a tree to bar or farm to bar has gone from a sort of minimalist kind of position to a maximalist position in terms of ownership, right? Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I'm, again, I'm, for me, having these discussions is an opportunity to hear what other people have to say. And it's also an opportunity for me to speak out loud to hear what other people, to hear what I say and to hear if I actually believe what it is that I'm saying, right? And so this is part of the discussion. I am not dogmatic about these things. Um, I am willing to look at new evidence and new lines of reasoning, new argument, and to have my mind changed, right? And that's one of the reasons why I love doing these live streams. Um, and, um, and I hope you agree. Um, it's it's been really really fantastic for me. I want to say hello to Giuseppe, who's probably um, connecting from um, Legnano in Italy today. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today, Giuseppe. Um, haven't heard from you in a while. Um, hope you're doing hope you're doing well. Uh, for people who may not know, Giuseppe is international sales director at, at FBM. And another conversation from another question from. Uh, Teresa, so how do we get the whole industry on the same page for when more than one part of the industry is working on defining the terms? Um, well, um, having the discussions out in the open. So I know that I know that there is a, an Associação Bean the Bar Brazil that's going on 
that not going on. I know there's an associate Sal Bino Bar Brazil, and they're wrestling with these questions right now. What does it mean to be Bean to Bar? What does it mean to be foreign to Bar? And it's happening within the his, with, happening within the culture of Brazilian chocolate. They have the advantage of starting you know, 15 to 20 years after we did here in the United States. Um, and so they can learn our lessons. And the, some of the people I know are pushing towards a very, very uh, maximalist definition of what bean to bar is. And they're loading things. You know, if you want to be bean to bar, you have to be bean to bar. You have to own the factory and you have to be ethical and you have to be sustainable. That's what we mean by bean to bar. Um, and there are other people who are going, yeah, no, maybe not, right? Um, and so it's playing out in different ways in different cultures. Um, there was um, a, a Twitter, um, there was a tweet that was made earlier today about the uh, Spanish Bean to Bar Chocolate Association. I want to hear what it is that they have to say, what, what definition that they've come up to. Personally, I think, um, Teresa, is that we need... Um, you know, people who've been here before uh, may have heard um, Nick from One One Cacao down in Jamaica talk about we need a cooperative in producing countries, not cooperatives in growing countries. <clears throat> and so I personally think there needs to be an association. Um, and this is something that I've been talking about from Clubhouse days. We're talking about, you know, over a year ago now about the notion of um, an association where all of the money, not all of the money, but the vast majority of the money that comes from the dues and other forms of incomes from the members is arranged at marketing, right? Um, and that, that we try to the extent possible to be able to agree on definitions um, as well as um, imagery that might be used, right? It is, um, but coming to a consensus that is workable uh, makes a whole lot of sense. And I, I, I think that it has to be, to some extent, um, we need to recognize the differences in certain parts of the world and different countries about exactly how to take that. So for example, one way, if I were talking about craft chocolate in the United States, um, I might actually say in Brazil, it would make more sense to use the phrase bean to bar than craft, right? Just because of what it is that I've learned about um, the chocolate industry, the small maker chocolate industry in Brazil over the last couple of years. Um, and so there needs to be that flexibility, but there needs to be a shared commitment that what we need to do in order to grow the industry, right, is to be able to start marketing in a way that doesn't confuse our potential customers. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Um, and Teresa, I hope that I answered that question. I mean, I've talked about it. I had this idea for something called One World Chocolate that could be a part of that. I've got some other marketing ideas that I'm working on um, that I hope will sort of uh, push people in a direction where they can go, I can get behind that. I'm willing to support what's going on. Um, Nick, um, let's get to this question, the FCIA glossary project. Let me get to that because I want to make sure that we have a chance to actually hit the last definition, which is craft. All right, I want to make sure that I have a chance to talk about it I've sort of run through to the end. So craft chocolate. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions that was asked um, to me, and it's on, it's on the page, about whether we should talk about craft in terms of a craftsperson or an artisan. It's craft chocolate if there's a craftsperson or artisan involved. And are craft and artisan synonymous? I mean, there's a whole lot of research that's been done. Um, so I believe that uh, Dr. Kirsty Lesty has, Chrissy Lesty has done, done some research on it. I believe that the Fine Cocoa and Chocolate Industry, Industry Five Co Fine Cocoa and Chocolate um, Institute has done some work on that. Um, and there's not a whole lot of consensus about what craft and artisan mean, right? Um, so I don't know that I want to associate craft with this notion of um, craftsperson. You know, and I want to go craftsman. So is it gendered? It shouldn't be. Right. Um, but I also don't want to get into the notion of craft or bean to bar, by the way. This is another place is that bean to bar means you're doing stone on stone grinding. Right. Or bean on bean, bean to bar, bean craft means that anything up to 100 kilos a batch. Right? And if you go above 100 kilos a batch, you're no longer bean to bar. You're no longer craft or you can't be bean to bar. You can't be craft if you process more than 100 metric tons of cocoa beans a year or some other number. I don't, every time you add those kinds of qualifiers onto a base definition, what you're doing is you're giving somebody a reason to object. Well, I produce, I, I process 104 metric tons of cocoa beans a year. 
I'm above 100 metric tons. Does this mean somehow automatically, you know, that something happens to this four metric tons and I'm no longer capable of producing a quality project product? The answer is absolutely not. So I think that being dogmatic about these things is one of the reasons why we haven't been able to reach consensus, right? And I think it's a major problem. So um, a couple of years ago, so I've been talking about this since at least 2017. I gave a presentation um, in Peru and then in Brazil on the future of craft chocolate. And I've been talking about this idea. Um, so I've been thinking about it for a little bit longer, perhaps much longer. I've been thinking about these ideas for 20 some odd years now. Um, but um, think of craft as a continuum. And on one end, um, you've got craft chocolate. The other hand, you have an industrial confectioner, right? And so one of the ways I think of an industrial confectionery chocolate maker is you become an industrial um, chocolate maker <clears throat> when concerns about consistency, right, right, become your primary concerns because your customers demand it. You're an industrial chocolate maker because your customers demand that every batch tastes the same or that every batch have the same rheology, or that every batch have the same pH, because their recipes and their manufacturing processes depend upon it, right? So that's, that's an easy definition, right? And that and your craft chocolate maker, eh, you know, that, that consistency is not on your radar, right? Every single bar, every single, not every single bar, but every single bag of beans, every single batch is a new opportunity for creative inspection, right? So you are an you are right engaged in artistic creative process. You are making creative decision making. Um, you are making creative decisions, right? Your fingers are in the in every single batch. You may say, "Well, you know, these beans. I need to roast them for another five minutes today. It needs to be more temperature. Um, it needs to be a higher or lower temperature." And that may be right a bad example, but it gives you an idea of you know the kind of thing that I may say. I may take them out of the roaster early because I think they smell a particular kind of way. I may have put them in the refiner, but I think they need another hour or two in the refiner for this batch, right? I've got a separate conch, and so I'm going to conch them differently because I want to deliver a different, um, a different um, experience. And I think that this is where the aspect of crafts in terms of craftsperson and craft in terms of artisan. But for me, it's about a creative decision-making process. I, as a chocolate maker, have an aesthetic. I have a statement that I'm trying to make. Right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with my cocoa beans and my equipment to be able to deliver right, this expression. And delivering that expression, I think, really begins to get at the heart of, the, of what I think is the fundamental differentiation between craft and industrial. So as a craft chocolate maker, what it is that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to express the flavor potential of my beans. Right. So that's it. I'm, it's all about flavor. I'm trying to express the flavor potential of the beans. And if the beans are different, then the potential is different. Right. And I'm going to come up with something that is different. I want to be able to maximize that through whatever lens my, I'm tasting. Right. Or whatever my personal philosophy is about what this is. Right. An industrial chocolate maker is about achieving consistency. Right. What they're going to do is they're going to take the ingredients, right? They're going to change from year to year, harvest to harvest. And what they're doing is they're forcing it into a, into a pre-programmed idea of what that flavor should be every single time. So they're manufacturing, they're adding flavor, they're doing all of these things you know, in the manufacturing process to arrive at a preconceived notion. They're not looking at what the individual flavor potential of the beans is. And I think that is the fundamental difference between craft. It's about maximizing flavor potential. It's about maximizing the expression of flavor as opposed to trying to arrive at a predetermined notion of what the flavor should be. And so when we talk about craft chocolate, we talk about marketing craft chocolate, we talk about selling chocolate, we should be talking about flavor, right? And one of the ways we can talk about flavor is to talk about origins. I mean, if I'm a big chocolate maker, I might be able to say all the beans are from Venezuela or all the beans are Colombia or all the beans are from Ecuador or all the beans are from Peru. But what I may not be able to say is that for, they're, from, um, they're from Tuta and uh, Juliana Quino of Valle Punta Muju outside, outside of Itabuna in the state of Bahia in Brazil, in southern, in southern Bahia in Brazil, right? So as a maker getting as close to origin as you possibly can with what it is you're doing and making that the focus of what you're doing in addition to the flavor. Now, I don't believe you need to go deep into flavor notes, 
Um, uh, I'm really a fan of the way Cho did it. I mean, this is a fruity bar. This is a chocolatey bar. This is a nutty bar. I mean, they had four different flavor profiles. I think that's all you need to do for the vast majority of customers. Now you might want to do it for a more highly trained customer or highly same, um, more highly experienced customer. It might be a better way to think about it. But I don't think you necessarily need to do that for a new customer. You just need to say, this is going to give you a great chocolatey experience. And that's where I would go with that. But if I want to talk about chocolate, what is craft chocolate? What is craft chocolate? And how is it different from confectionery chocolate, right? Or industrial chocolate? It's all about maximizing flavor potential. And personally, unlike bean to bar, that's not something that an industrial chocolate maker can take away from you. They can't start marketing that. They can't tell you can't. You, they can't take that from you, right? They can't take it from us. And so the, talking about flavor and, and what we do and all that kind of stuff, I think is the way to differentiate what is we're doing from the rest of what's going on. And this is where I have to say that, you know, Nick, if you're still in the room, um, that, you know, the conversation that I had with Spencer um, for an hour or two before um, the Chocoa panel that we were both on and listening to Spencer during the panel is um, completely well, I don't know that it's completely changed uh, because I still like the continuum of craft at one end and confectionery or industrial chocolate at the other. But this notion of focusing on flavor and focusing on bean origin, right, um, to as close as we can to the smallest geographical region that we can um, is is one of the ways that, um, that craft chocolate can differentiate itself from industrial chocolate. So having gone there, um, so Olga, I uh, don't know where in the world you're connecting in one, but I agree about to make it clear. Years ago, there were other issues regarding harmonized system code differentiation, but not fermenting cocoa and fine cocoa. Um, and it should work as well from craft to bean to bar to industrial chocolate. Um, there's probably two or three hours or, or, or careers worth of um, this. Um, uh, just talking about these kinds of issues. Um, I believe that notions of that you're talking about, Olga, where what I would do is I would thinking about putting these kinds of these kinds of ideas into a, a geographic indicator or a denomination of origin. Um, and we can encapsulate these ideas within the within the uh, excuse me, within, you know, getting a little Spanish pronunciation of the nomination de origen. Um, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and I think that it matters to a relatively small group of people. What I think it's most important is how do you, how do you embed the idea of communicating around flavor potential um, in the system of selling and buying cocoa? I mean, one of the things I'm working on is an end-to-end -end traceability platform, which right now is focused on um, how do we maintain traceability through the manufacturing processes? So I want to make sure that no matter what the ingredient is, coming into the factory when it gets to shipping dock, I can maintain traceability. It turns out that's harder in many respects than other aspects of getting it from the farm to the factory, right? But what we really wanna do as a part of that is we wanna be able to enable a seller to say, oh, I have a cocoa of excellence award for my cocoa and here is the flavor potential for the cocoa that I have. And I wanna be able to signal to buyers, hey, I have cocoa that will generate these kinds of flavors in a finished chocolate. And you can say, I'm a buyer, I'm interested in cocoa that will generate, you know, that cocoa that will give me these flavor profiles. And there's the MOCA, the Lutheran World Relief Central American Flavor Map Project, work that Zoe Papalex and her team are doing um, that, you know, fits into that. Um, so I think that it's really, really important um, as a plank for what's going on, but I think as a supporting plank, not as part of the base definitions. Um, Bruce, uh, Blue Spruce, I'm sorry. Bruce, uh, Mark, a key definition is to whether focus on the flavor potential of the beans. If you disagree, let me know. Um, again, what I'm doing is I'm trying to say, how do we come up with a definition that we can keep as a differentiator and that big chocolate can't steal from us? And I think that's really, really important. Ah, Olga, you're from Managua, Nicaragua. I haven't been to Nicaragua since 2017. I hope things are going well for you. Uh, one of the reasons why I haven't been is that um, um, there has been, you know, government government changes as a way of doing it. But I had just really, really fabulous times working in Nicaragua for a couple of years uh, with Ingaman. So up in um, uh, going all the way up into the country, into La Dalia and going in and to Maragalpa, seeing what they were doing in Las Maderas. I mean, it's a fabulously beautiful country. 
Um, and I had great times even going to the um, Wembes Market in Managua. I love going to markets and the Umberto Wembes Market is one of the most amazing markets that I've been to. Um, so Jeffrey, um, who's calling in from Marsata Chocolate or tuning in Marsata Chocolate in Manhattan Beach, California, I think. Uh, happy to be reading your screen because it means I found my glasses. <laughs> um, it's funny you should talk about flavor. So important. Uh, got the blessing recently from a brewmaster as his batch was lost in our bean to bar bonbons. So we have additional flavors to enhance the flavor of the bonbon. The small enhancement was a game changer for flavors. Now, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I do want to talk about, um, and I may, so I think that the next live stream is going to be about greenwashing. Because I don't know if people heard that Ben and Jerry's is getting together with Tony's Chocolate Only and do, putting Tony's um, chocolate in a Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavor. So we're going to talk about uh, what that means or what I think it might mean and other things related to greenwashing and how do you tell. So that's going to be on Friday. And then I'm looking at a future um, live stream. And I think that um, my approach to pairing. So I've done my approach to how I taste let's talk about how I pair and what it is that I'm looking for. And I think that, um, Jeffrey, the notion of the flavor was getting lost, um, in the batch. And so what do you do to bring the flavor back is a very, very interesting, interesting conversation. I think one of the most important ones that we can all have when we talk about flavor. Although I think that most people, when they're talking about bean to bar chocolate are you know focused on the two ingredient dark chocolate. And, um, that's it. Um, so last question, and we're running a little long. I don't mind. I don't, I'm, you know, apart from, you know, talking and my throat being a little sore because I don't talk that much um, when I'm alone at my desk working away. So Nick, uh, for people who don't know, Nick is involved with Cocoa Runners in the UK. Um, and, um, you know, um, we, we've had a number of conversations. Um, so what's my take on the FCIA glossary project? Is that where global definitions will be settled on? Let me ask, let me answer the second question, the second question first, right? And the answer is no, the global definitions will not be settled on in the FCI, FCI glossary. One of the reasons why is, in my opinion, is the FCIA is too dominantly a North American organization. They don't represent world opinion, number one. Uh, and number two is that, um, uh, in my opinion, just the word fine in the name. They're so focused on the word fine. If you actually go look at the choice of words that they used, um, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm going, you know, let me see if I can get this on. Um, so I've actually started working on a spreadsheet, right? Here is the spreadsheet where I've taken a look at, you know, what their, what the glossary is. And so a couple of things that's missing, right? For example, um, is I think they have a definition down here of um, FOB, so which is free on board. If I, there it is, FOB, but they're missing SIF, right? Well, um, why is SIF missing from it? There's no discussion, for example, of ISO 34101, which is a global standard, international standards organization of um, for sustainability and transparency. They don't talk about the Code of Federal Regulations or the Codex Alimentarius. They're not talking about the Food Safety Manufacture, um, Food Safety Modernization Act, the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. They don't talk about the FCC, which is not the Federal Communications Commission, but it's the uh, Federation of Cocoa Commerce. They don't mention what the cocoa main. So there's a lot of stuff that's not in here, right? That represents, I think, a sort of fundamental bias that the FCIA has all right, about um, the way they're, um, the way they see the world, right? There's also a sense, and this is what I talk, um, I talk about another one of the important aspects of what I talk about when it comes to the idea of when we need a shared language, there needs to be community, there needs to be about awareness of what the community is. There's also a notion of diversity. And when I say diversity, people may know from previous um, um, topics, um, previous live streams that I've done, is when I think about diversity, what I think about is I think about diversity of products, right? That if what we want to do is we want to grow the industry, right? Then what we need to do is we need to be thinking about more than two ingredients, 70% single origin chocolate. We need to be doing all kinds of milk and alternative milks 
um, and non-standard dairy milks. We need to be doing inclusions. We need to do, I mean, and we need to be doing things which are associated with um, the particular country and food culture that I'm in. Um, um, so um, we need to be thinking about um, those kinds of issues. And I'm sorry, I, I took a look at a question that was down here and I lost my train of thought. So we're talking about diversity, right? So diversity is more than about, well, it's important to have more women involved. It's important to have uh, different ethnic minorities, um, cultural minority, however we want to define minorities. It's just, we, we need that diversity. I think to grow, we need diversity of products. I mean, for example, if you're not making something which has got salted caramel in it, number one, number one flavor in the world, Right now for confectionery, you're leaving money on the table. If you don't have a product that appeals to a five-year-old, um, then you're leaving money on the table. If you want to go, right? So, you know, you're over here and you're making the equivalent of a high IBU IPA and that's all you're making. You're just making, the only difference is the kind of hops you're using. So you've got some Cascade hops on this one. You have some other kind of hops in another one, but all you're doing is stuff that's in the 70, 80 IB or higher IBU range on an IPA, right? And people over here are used to drinking uh, Miller Lite. I mean, chances are they may try it once, but they're not gonna eat it on a regular basis. And if that's all you make, you're not gonna be able to expand um, your customer base. So what you wanna do is you need to make more stuff like what they like. And it doesn't mean you're selling out. It doesn't mean you're compromising your artistic integrity, right? You need to have cash cows. You need to have products that people will come in that will pay all your bills on a regular basis. So that what you do is you have the luxury to be able to go and I am going, this is the chocolate that I make, right? That represents the, the pinnacle of my idea of our artistic expression, right? You, you, but you, if that's all you do, right? You make it much more difficult for yourself to make, um, to have a sustainable business. And I got news for you. If you don't have a sustainable business, you can't be a direct trade chocolate maker. I mean, you need to focus on how do I create a business which is going to be sustainable if what it is you want to do is you want to support all these things going on at the farm, in my opinion. Last question from Susana Cardenas, uh, Susana Cardenas, who um, probably is in Ecuador at the moment. So Susana, thank you very much. What if a direct member of the family owns the cacao farm? Um, I would say that's okay. Um, I would say that's okay um, as long as you're in the same country. Um, so am I treat a bar if the farm is in Colombia and I'm in Ecuador? I think that would be a stretch. Um, I, you know, I don't know the answer to it. It's ownership interest. Do I personally have to do it? Is it a close member of my family? I would be, I personally would think it would be okay if it is a member of the family. Um, now, is it fourth cousin three times removed? Uh, might have a challenge there. Um, but I think that, you know, if, you, man, that's my feeling, right? If it's your brother or your father or your uncle or your sister-in-law, um, I think, oops, battery ran out on my light. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I think you have to do it. But if you're going to use the term being farm to bar or tree to bar and doing it, you need to be able to talk about it's a family farm um, and you need to talk about what the nature of that relationship is. Um, I, I, I don't like the word transparency as much as I like the word visibility. If you can provide visibility into what you're actually doing, then I think it's fine, right? You need to be straightforward. You know, it's, it's ethical. As long as it's ethical in the sense of not taking advantage of anybody, you're not representing something that is not the case in order to be able to, in order to be able to, um, um, to be able to adopt a position which you can't adopt, then I don't have a problem um, with um, that. Um, but I think that you need to be open and transparent and let people know exactly what it is that you're thinking, what the relationship is, if you want to be able to make that claim. Um, anyway, yeah, that's it. So we've gone long today. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. Listen, I am really, really thankful for everybody who's asked um, great questions, made some fabulous comments. I appreciate um, all of that. Thank you very much for doing that. I hope, um, you know, people, what people are going to do is I want them to go to the chocolatelife.com. So let's go 
to the homepage of the Chocolate Life right now. This is the live homepage. You can see what it's doing. Um, click on the join button if you're not currently a member. Please do that. Um, there's always a free level. Um, if you like what it is that I'm doing, you want to support the live streams, um, the research, the work that goes into doing them, just supporting the Chocolate Life, um, please do that. I know that there are some more expensive levels. They involve consulting. Um, if you want one-on-one -on -one support, I can provide that uh, to you as well. So yeah, please consider um, supporting um, the Chocolate Life in that way. Um, but one of the things that um, if you're not already um, a member um, and you haven't already done it is um, go to um, YouTube um, and give me a hit on the subscribe button. What that will do is it will let the YouTube gods know that um, the gods, YouTube gods, Algo and Rhythm, those are the YouTube gods, um, know that you're watching and paying attention to what we're doing here and that um, they will reward us by um, promoting this much more widely. More people will get involved, ask questions, and we can, we can grow the community. And with that, I'm going to say thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, everybody. I'm going to be back um, on Friday from noon to one Eastern daylight time. Uh, and we're going to be talking about greenwashing, uh, specifically the notion, uh, starting with the notion of um, Ben and Jerry's and Tony's Chocolate Only getting together. Um, there is a, 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 a regular Chocolate Life Live listener who's um, who's following in from Australia, who has some questions about the way chocolate is perceived in Australia. Again, fair trade and things like that. And we're going to throw that into sort of the greenwashing, the greenwashing bucket as well for next Friday. And um, saying thank you very much again, everybody. And remember, if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong.